Welcome to Blackhawks Insider, the official podcast of the Chicago Blackhawks, presented by Chevy Drives, Chicago.com. Drive what Captain Jonathan Taves drives. Make sure you subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Simplecast, Spotify, or whatever podcast platform you use, and like our YouTube page as well, as all videos are posted on the Hawks' YouTube page. Welcome into the show. Welcome to March. Welcome to post-trade deadline in the NHL season. Chris Foster is joined by Colby Cohen, Kaylee Chelios, and the aftermath of the NHL trade line, guys, trade deadline, it, it, it's hitting us at the sponsorship level. I mean, no longer is it drive what Kane and Taves drives for ChevyDriveChicago.com. It's just drive what the captain Jonathan Taves drive. It's still a great tagline, but man, it's uh, it still feels different. Nothing was ever the same. Am I right, Kaylee? I agree. I still think it's weird going into the locker room as we went to go meet everybody and seeing Patrick Kane's stall, no nameplate, nobody sitting in it, kind of just there. It still hasn't quite sunk in, um, you know, just going into that room still and not having him be a part of it anymore, Colby. It's, it's, it's a little weird. It's fun getting to know all the new faces, and they're still trying to learn each other's names at the same time, but... It certainly still hasn't quite sunk in that, you know, 88 is no longer a Blackhawk officially. Yeah, and you, you have to wonder if one day they will reoccupy that stall and kind of like put like a glass shrine around it. Um, like, will you, uh, would you sit there if you're, if you're coming into a team? Like, how does that typically no work in a locker room, Colby, when a player yeah. like that leaves? Who, who sits there? Does anybody I mean, sit there? Yeah, so I don't have any experience with that, obviously, in particular. But um, I do remember in the in the locker room in Colorado, um, and this is a different situation because Joe Sackick retired, you know, as a member of the Avalanche. But his stall um, had literally like a glass like a glass box around it, and his like gear was still in it um, in the locker room. So. Like he was Maybe like that. resting in state or something like that. Like a funeral <laughs> or his no, uh, his, no equi- white. <laughs> his his equipment was just enshrined, I guess, in inside the Avalanche locker room at the time. Um, probably still there, I would assume, but uh, maybe not since he's the GM and pres. Well, he's not the GM anymore; he's the president now. So maybe he's like, "No, nah, I don't want to see that every day." But. Um, <laughs> It's definitely uh, a big stall to fill. <laughs> we'll 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 say that. How do, how do we think about Patrick Kane wearing number eighty eight on a Rangers sweater? I, I will say that you know the Rangers have a, have an iconic look as well. I, I don't. I'm not going to say it's better than the Blackhawks sweater. And Patrick Kane referenced that in his thank you to Chicago. <laughs> you mentioned the most iconic sweater in the in the NHL on the day he was traded. But uh, listen, as a broadcaster, I have a bone to pick with the New York Rangers jerseys because the shadow numbers, as they call them, on the back, you know, you've got, what is it, red with a white shadow. It, it's actually really hard to read. It almost looks blurry from up in the press box. But first two games, Colby, no points for Patrick Kane with New York Rangers. But I'm sure they're pressing the panic button in, in New York. But I don't know. It, it's not that big of a deal, right? I mean, the media is pressing the panic button, but I can't imagine uh, the team, you know, internally is pressing the panic button. You know, you it takes time to get used to a new team. I mean, it was two games. There was no practices. The New York Rangers had to play both of those games shorthanded. Um, not easy to play against the Boston Bruins with two less skaters. You know, I mean, that, that's that's difficult. Uh, just, you know, you don't necessarily get into a rhythm with your line mates, your D partners. So they had four days of practice this week. Um, and, and again, I, I think there's going to be a figuring out process. I think that teams are always slightly hesitant to make big, big changes at the deadline, especially to a team that's that's doing well, because, you know, it, it changes the chemistry of your of your lines in your locker room. It's one thing to bring in a guy who might play on your second line or might be like a role player, like a Sam Lafferty type of players. But when you bring in Patrick Kane, um, 
uh, that's different. I mean, that's that's <laughs> very large. And on top of it, Vladimir Tarasenko two, three weeks earlier. I mean, those are two players that are going to play 20 minutes a night. That really changes the dy- you know, the dynamic of, of your team. So I, I think the New York Rangers are going to be okay. And I, and I think Patrick Kane will do very well in New York. But it, it has not been a pretty start um, at all. And... Uh, I'll be interested to see if Thursday when they play their next game looks any better. The Rangers weren't playing their best hockey either before Patrick Kane showed up. I mean, they were playing a lot better, especially that statement game they put on against the Blackhawks earlier in the season. But I I do think there's the human element of it too. Like you said, Colby, Patrick Kane shows up. It's an emotional goodbye from Chicago. Yes, it's exciting everything's new but once that kind of settles down your family gets there it's probably really overwhelming he probably hasn't stopped getting a million text messages and calls about what's going on and and how he's adjusting so I do think you just look at what he's done and when the Rangers make the playoffs he's going to be clutch he won three Stanley Cup championships that's why they brought him in he's clutch he finishes when the game's on his stick he thrives under pressure that's not really the, the position that he's in at the moment. It's a good thing there's still a month really before playoffs, and, and that's where that's where the Rangers are going to look for Patrick Kane specifically. So certainly no time to hit the panic button, Chris. All, well, Chris, not to, to – let me just finish Colby. my thoughts. Sorry. Yeah. But um, you know what else is really difficult, and, and this isn't something anybody really thinks about? Here's a new pair of gloves. Here's a new helmet. Here's a new pair of pants. Like, breaking in hockey gear – you know, uh, look, I'm first world problems here, but it, it's not ideal. You know, it's not ideal to be handed all that new gear with a day. You know, what did he practice one day with the team or did he have one morning skate with the team before he gets thrown into those games? And I've watched Kaner over the last couple of seasons, you know, especially from between the benches. I mean, he changes his gloves he goes from pair to pair throughout the night. They're all stacked under the, the bench a certain way. They're all broken in to a certain amount. The palms are a certain way. And, yeah, he got all his stuff. You know, they got working on all that right away. He wears a special size cuff on his glove. But it, it, it's not easy. The, even the helmet, like, you don't, you don't change your helmet during the season that often. And you wouldn't think – Oh, really? Like, it's just a helmet. But, like, it feels a certain way on your head. And then you start, like, adding all these little factors up. That's why it takes players that get traded a little bit of time to, to settle in. It, it, is, it is different. And, and um, pregame meal is a little bit different. What time your, your power play meeting is a little bit different. Your whole routine gets thrown off. Uh, and, and the one thing we all know about Patrick Kane is his routine – is very important and you know he's very regimented so you know Chris I I think that um that's why you have to afford him you got to give him a couple weeks here before we're really oh this worked it didn't work whatever like there has to be some patience for people it amounts to a preseason for Patrick Kane at this point just to get ready for the playoffs And, and remember Blackhawks fans that we're all Rangers fans now with the hope that should the Rangers advance to the Eastern Conference Finals the 2023 second round pick that the Blackhawks received for Patrick Kane would then become a 2024 first round pick. Uh, but quickly, to the point of, of of gloves and how pampered hockey players are. Did you see the pampered. video of... Whoa, of, whoa, whoa, whoa. Pampered. Listen, uh, yes, yes. Former Blues captain and current Toronto Maple Leaf centerman Ryan O'Reilly. I think it was a video that I saw that he gets his gloves changed out every five to ten minutes and... He comes to the bench and he just goes like this with his gloves, like, and they get taken <laughs> off and then dried in. Like he gets new ones put on. It's like, come on. He's, I, I mean, <laughs> you I think start I'm doing that with your microphone, Chris. I mean, <laughs> I like. I was happy to get one. I, I guys, I have one microphone for the season. Okay? I was I'm just trying. gonna say, Kaylee, Kaylee, you should have seen one night. Pat Boyle and I had to go in. Oh wait, you were the three. It was the three of us. Remember the the scramble to get the mic because Chris took his mic. So I was yeah. sitting there and I was like, "You got it, Kaylee. I'll I'll sit off to the side without my mic." Yeah. I mean, the, I do. Remember we got that. Ryan O'Reilly. We're on our podcast with Ryan O'Reilly Jr. here with his with a special <laughs> microphone. I mean, I, I mean, like we witnessed this. <laughs> what are we talking about here? <laughs> I forgot about That's that. That's a great point. 
<laughs> I Thanks will for say, reminding though, us, Chris. Very true, but I think most of that is from a a, a germs perspective, right, Chris? Post COVID, yes, headset, you got to have a personal headset. Yeah, I mean, look, like you're eating the microphone during the game. <laughs> all right, I mean, yeah, it's, you've it's also right eaten. You've also eaten off my plate before, so like I don't understand why I couldn't use your headset. Wait, to that point as well, have you ever put on a headset and in St. Louis, I could smell the peanuts on the headset oh, from whoever was housing peanuts gross. and calling that's a rough. game because they have salted peanuts in the press box there oh. as well as very ripe Starburst, but I could not get over the smell of the peanuts on the headset the oh. whole time I was doing the game. <laughs> Yeah, peanuts and just the peanut there. fomites that are being sprayed you, onto the microphone. You gotta wait. You gotta get that disinfectant spray, and when you walk into that building, you just gotta give that little microphone. Oh, one, he said uh, he sprayed spray. it. That was a permanent peanut smell. Whoever, all the broadcasters that must come oh. to St. Louis must just house peanuts before they get on the air. It was crazy. Uh, wait, also, I was Kaylee gonna. Oh calling, no, you go. You go. Call, calling Starburst ripe, like they grow on trees. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm not I, a I huge wish they Starburst person, but they had the perfect textured Starburst. I must have had 20 of them in the booth that night, Chris. You can attest to how good they were. Yeah, I, I house Starburst, though, whether they're ripe or not. But <laughs> they were very good. They were very good in St. Louis. That's for Colby, sure. I wasn't going to say anything. I wasn't... I wasn't going to say anything, Kaylee, because I was just happy to hear that you're eating candy. So I, I was just going to let that go. I mean, it humanizes big, me to you. <laughs> you've had a big week of drinking soda, eating candy. Whoa, you know, whoa. A, whoa. A, some things a, are for the podcast. Some things are for private. <laughs> <laughs> we uh, saw Kaylee House at Ginger Ale the other day, and we, Colby's and my jaws both hit the floor. I was thirsty and I didn't have another beverage. Okay. I'm not usually a pop girl, but here we are. Anyway, to your point, Chris, on Ryan O'Reilly and some of the pampering, I will say I was talking to Troy Parchment and he's been with the Blackhawks for 28 years, one of the equipment managers. And he did say there is, um, for players like Patrick Kane, when they go somewhere, they've earned the right to have special treatment one-on-one fresh gloves every five minutes if that's the case so a younger player that maybe comes into the league is not going to have the same experience that somebody like a Patrick Kane will have going to New York with their staff and what he had in the locker room uh, with the training staff here in Chicago that is one thing that the training staff certainly has missed is the one-on-one time with Kane every day he had his routine over 16 seasons and it's gone. So I think that's really when things sunk in for them. <laughs> well, O'Reilly's always been really finicky about his gear, even going back to, you know, we played together, you know, rookie seasons. And, you know, he wasn't doing the glove thing at that point, but he would spend like an hour taping a stick. And, like, he was maniacal about <laughs> getting everything cut and his pants. And he would, like, do, like, his own little surgery routine on some of his elbow pads and – uh, I'm sure he's been in the league now for, you know, 13, 14 years, um, O'Reilly probably. So it's it's probably gotten a lot worse. And on top of it, he just broke his finger. So maybe oh, yeah, we need right. to look into what the padding was like on those gloves because uh, they, they didn't do their job for him, Chris. Well, Kaylee mentioned that kind of sink-in moment for the Blackhawks equipment staff when – they realized that Patrick Kane was gone. I think everybody around the Blackhawks organization, fans included, and perhaps especially, may have had that moment as well. But look, there is still Jonathan Taves. He's still here, and he's not skating right now, but he's still around the team. He's working out. He's he's hopefully ramping up for a comeback later this season. We've got about 19 games left. But, uh, Kale, you saw him around the – the facilities, right? And, and we actually heard Luke Richardson, Blackhawks head coach, speak to that as well. And it's, you know, he's got such a presence also that even when he's around but not playing, it, it that still kind of rubs off on the team. Yeah, I, I haven't seen him around a lot, but it, you can hear players within the locker room talking about him, their interactions. Luke's been talking about him being around the rink. So it's great to know that he is there and he's still having an impact on these guys, especially in a new room. Uh, they're kind of finding a new identity again, and it's great to have Taze there to 
share his experiences and, and what's going to help them be successful for the remaining 19 games. So I didn't want to bother him and, you know, check in, ask him how he's doing, because I'm sure it's a really hard time for him trying to work back to full health. But, you know, he had a big smile on his face and, and was just happy to be at the rink again. So that's always an encouraging sign. Colby that he's he's around, he's here, uh, he's still the captain, and he's still having an impact despite not being able to do that on the ice right now. And, and you know, I, I hope that um, like health is always first and foremost. I mean, I think the last couple of years have really painted that picture vividly for us all in different areas of sports or life or, you know, there's been on-field incidents and, you know, so that's number one, right? So that's sits in its own category. But I do hope that there's some sort of finale, you know, for him this season. I really do hope that he can get on the ice and, and play games this season. Um, the guy has had such a historical career here. Um, you know, we obviously don't know what the future holds for him. He's a UFA at the end of the season. Does he want to be here? Does he, is he ready to retire? Like who knows? You know, I don't, I bet you he doesn't even know the answer to that question, but you know, I, I just, for any and all athletes, like we got to see Patrick Kane have some like pretty legendary moments before he got traded. Um, I mean, that that uh, disallowed goal was like the coolest disallowed goal any of us have ever seen. I mean, Kaylee, you're and Scott's reaction and Pat's was it's it's like such a great video that keeps getting played because it was just it really shows the the emotion of it all. Um, and I, I just hope for for Taves sake, you know, that he gets an opportunity to get back on the United Center ice this season um because we don't know what the future holds and and you know some players retire the game sometimes the game retires the player uh you hope everybody gets that moment especially a guy like him i mean you know uh, probably a, a statue at some point you know for jonathan taves i mean that that's sort of the the level we're talking about here so um you just kind of hope it, hope he gets that. And, and, you know, I, I, I hope we all get to see it and hopefully it's a game that we're all doing. So we're, we're, you know, able to, to, to speak to it, but, um, you know, first and foremost, uh, hopefully his, his health will progress and, and we'll see him back out on the ice wearing that 19 sweater. There are uh, believe it or not, only, I'm doing a quick count here. Seven home games left in the regular season. Eight of the next nine for the Blackhawks are on the road. But uh, there's a homestand at the end of March into the beginning of April. Vancouver, Dallas, St. Louis, New Jersey. Uh, who knows? Hopefully hopefully we'll see the captain back then, if not sooner. Uh, what about the new guys, everybody? A lot of fresh faces. I mean, the last couple of games after the trade deadline... Uh, March 4th against Nashville, and even March 6th against Ottawa. I mean, during during warm-ups pregame, I, I was splitting my attention half on the Blackhawks side of the ice, half on the other team side of the ice. And, and typically, I'm more keyed in, quite honestly, on the road team as they warm up. I'm quizzing myself on the lines, making sure there aren't any unexpected numbers on the ice and warm-ups that I didn't see during morning skate or in the previous game, but... I, it was like, and Luke Richardson, I think, said it best. It was like training camp or a preseason game all over again with the number of new faces, new numbers on the roster. And look, we were just talking about this with Patrick Kane and his new environment with New York Rangers. I mean, there's got to be a feel-out process that goes on while you adjust to a new city, a new rink, a new practice facility, etc. But I, I thought that the game against Ottawa on March 6th, just last Monday, really marked a, a turning point where the guys that had come over pre-trade trade deadline really started to look comfortable and make some plays. There was Anders Bjork, who had a three-assist night. I thought Joey Anderson made some good plays on the fourth line. Uh, Nikita Zaitsev and Andreas Englund are starting to gel as, as a defensive pair. Uh, Colby, what have you thought about some of the fresh faces for the Blackhawks? Wait, so first off, are we Anders or are we Anders? Just okay, well, I, yeah, we can go through that now if you'd like. So, <laughs> you know, and again, I'm introducing myself to all the new guys in the locker room. And so I went up to Anders Bjork and I asked him, hey, man, Anders or Anders? And he said, 
you know, he's he's from Mequon, Wisconsin, right? He's he's an American. His parents and his family call him Anders. But again, he's got a, a you know a, a Swedish name, and you know the tendency among hockey players is to just assume that it's Anders. But so he said that although the hockey community ha- has has called him Anders, his family calls him Anders, and that's you know it, it, you know he doesn't care either way. But um, if you're looking to split the tie. I'll go. I'll go personally with with what his family says, and and that would be Anders. Well, you're you're the leader of the pack, so if it's Anders, it's <laughs> Anders. It threw me because I've done his games before, um, and I've called him Anders. So I was I was a little thrown and unsure of it. But as we've seen with guys, they they tend to tell you, yeah, you whatever, you can call me whatever, and we're like, no, we're not striving for whatever. We we want to know what your name is, what your parents named you because we want to we don't want to upset your parents at the end of the day right we don't want to look mom in the eye next year and say sorry for saying your name wrong it it's the same it's the same as anders lee for the for the new york islanders it it, it, you know everyone i think maybe by default calls him anders but yeah me too i'm I'm guilty of that too (laughs) two notre dame guys too yeah exactly yeah two yeah, yeah two notre dame guys well, look, Mario, I mean, he, Mario he, or Mario Lemieux? We came across that no. on on the the previous broadcast for the Sands. Mario, two different, right? It, 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 it's Mario, Kaylee. Right, <laughs> it's we're, Mario. We're, we're, we're Canadians right? or something. But here. wait, Kaylee, is there? I mean, look, Kaylee is pretty deeply embedded no, with that. I say that Mario, hockey. but okay, I have heard right. a lot of Mario and and uh, you know a lot of East Coast people, a lot of lacrosse teammates of mine have always said Mario. So I, well, I heard my, both my, on the Ottawa broadcast the other night, and Chris and I were in, in cahoots. <laughs> my my wife is from South Philly, so if you ask her, it's, it's Mario. They certainly don't yep. have Mario's in, in South Philadelphia in, in the <laughs> you know heavily Italian community of South Philadelphia. But um, they got, yeah, they got a lot of Mario's though. <laughs> <laughs> in one in one per family, but. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, you know, it was good to see Bjork have a game like that, especially because his first game with the Blackhawks, um, I could just see he was kind of getting frustrated with himself, uh, especially from between the benches, Kaylee. You know, like we get that amazing vantage point. Um, and so it was nice to see him have that that type of game, that type of breakout game against Ottawa. And I remember him having really good moments for the Boston Bruins. And I remember him being a really high end player at Notre Dame, Um, you know, did some of his games at both of those places. So I think, I think he lost his confidence a little bit in Boston, which, which is not an unfamiliar story for a lot of players with Bruce Cassidy. Um, You know, you have to be really, thick skinned um if you're sort of a a guy trying to break in uh, under him and so uh, I think he kind of lost his confidence and then I think you know it's difficult for players sometimes to regain their confidence so this is such a great opportunity for him and such a great you know sort of tryout environment for him sort of England is kind of the same way these guys are kind of getting a a 20 game tryout um to show that they can play here next season and potentially beyond uh, and, and, you know, I, I'm with you, Chris and, and uh, Kaylee, you, you know, you had the best seat in the house last night for, you know, Bjork's big game. And I know England left the game a little bit early, but I agree, started to look a little more comfortable with Zaitsev, um, you know, especially after the first period. But, um, you know, as we said, it takes time, but good to see guys, you know, contributing early on. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, you know, he, Bjork would come back to the bench. He'd be frustrated if a shift didn't go his way, uh, although it seemed like everything was going his way against Ottawa. Uh, he had a really great game, and I do think having a couple games under your belt, same thing with Joey Anderson, having a few games under his belt now. I thought that he made some great plays on the PK, just little aggressive plays, stick plays, uh, one of them leading to Jujar Kara's breakaway, uh, a couple chances in the offensive zone. He created offense just by getting ahead of the play and anticipating passes. And so it was certainly a group effort. It did seem like everybody came together against the Senators. Uh, Great timing against the hottest team in the National Hockey League, besides maybe Carolina at that time, to to put on a performance like that from in that Alex Stalock. But the new guys certainly seemed like they fit in and were comfortable, more comfortable than they had been since trade deadline. 
against the Sens. Um, and England's unfortunate, too. He brings that big body physical presence they really needed against Ottawa and specifically Brady Kachuk just lingering around the blue paint a little too long all game. And he gets hit and unfortunately comes back to the bench in some pain, discomfort, and, and right away goes back to the dressing room after talking to the medical trainer. Um, so it, it was a great game for the Blackhawks, though, start to finish. And I'm probably most impressed by Alex Stalock and what he was able to do to hang in there and give his team a chance to win, getting outshot 12-3 to in the first period. And they were grade-A chances from elite players. <laughs> and one other thing on Bjork, Chris, um, so I ran into Eric Condra last night, who is a development coach for the Chicago Blackhawks. And um, he actually told me that him and him and Anders um, are cousins. So I, I had no idea about that. Um, I don't know if you guys I, – I don't think you guys – I don't think we said that at any point last night. I, I, I found out, like, right before the game and, and kind of forgot about it, you know, within – the big night that was happening, but, um, you know, uh, Condra again, played at Notre Dame as well, uh, had a solid run in the NHL, uh, and, and is one of our, you know, high end development coaches travels all around, meets with our players. He's been to Seattle a bunch this year with our guys out there. He's been to Boston. Uh, he go, he's in Denver, you know, he, he works with all of our prospects that are in Rockford, not in Rockford. So, uh, a nice little sort of tie into the organization, those two being related. So Eric was in the building last night. He wanted to see his cousin play. He certainly gave him something uh, to watch. <laughs> no doubt. And, uh, and and speaking of development, I think one thing that's been really cool, like a storyline that has been intermittently woven into this season has been Lucas Reichel's development at the NHL level. And, and he's in his third call-up to the Blackhawks this season. And every time, I think, that the amount of time it's taken for him to really flash that ability that makes him a prospect has gotten shorter and shorter. Like, it, it's, it's taken it, there, there's been less time for him to acclimate back to the NHL level before he really makes something happen. And he's got points in, in back to back games now and a really pretty goal on a breakaway in the win against Ottawa. So, I think that uh, that's been something that's really, really been fun to to witness and observe uh, most recently since the trade deadline and with respect to Lucas Reichel. Well, and I thought, too, it was great, him and his best friend, right, Tim Stutzla, 31 goals. He's having an incredible season. He's got great support with Kachuk and Giroux. They've had some great chemistry. So one of the, the bigger... One of the similarities between the two of them is that they're both looking to fill out, get a little bit bigger, be able to handle, you know, being in the NHL. You're, you're going to have to put on some size and be able to get more comfortable going into puck battles and being in the corners. And for Stutzla, he did fill out and put on some weight, and you could see his confidence with the puck. Obviously, his his skill and his shot on full display this season. But for Lucas Reichel, he put on 16 pounds in the off season. He's kind of in that tough phase towards the end of the season where you're up and down five, six pounds, and it's tough to keep on weight when you're playing every night. And um, I think for him, though, he's talked about same thing, where he's he's filled out a little bit more, and it has made him more comfortable holding on to pucks a little bit longer, battling in the corners, and, and, and making plays that maybe he wasn't able to do last year, just coming in as a rookie and not quite used to the speed, the pace, and some of these heavier teams in the Western Conference. So to your point, Chris, his development has been steadily progressing, and that's really just part of the plan from Kyle Davidson and the development staff. And I feel like with these guys, you watch them the, the hills, right? Devel yeah. This is development for most players. I mean, look, there's always the exception of the rule, right? There's always the guy who just comes and takes off and never looks back. I mean, but that's really not the, the, the rule. That's the exception. Most guys go – go like this. And I think we're now starting to get into the territory for Lucas where it's going to click. You're seeing a little bit over here, a little bit over there, a little bit over there and a little bit over here. And, you know, there's going to be this moment. Uh, it, it could be a play or it could be a game where he's going to, going to have that, that moment where it all just kind of makes sense. Um, and, and he really becomes an NHL player. And the funny thing is it may not even happen at the NHL level. 
uh, if that makes any sense. Because what I really want to see from him this year is is you know finish strong, whatever he he finishes here uh, in in Chicago, and then I want to see him go to Rockford, and I want to see him really put his team on his back and and go deep in the playoffs and win multiple rounds of the playoffs and him perform in all three zones in the playoffs of the American League because I think that's going to sort of catapult him to, to, to having a good summer and then coming here in September and being a Chicago Blackhawk full-time, putting that Rockford Ice Hogs bag away and, and really – becoming what we know he can become and and becoming what the flashes are every day every shift um and and i think we're close like i really do and i commend our our development staff and norm and kyle and and megan and jeff and everybody at eaton who has had the patience to let this guy work hit work through it um you, you just you don't see it too too often and and so it, it, it's been good to see although he may not agree with us if we had him on the podcast but there's a method to the madness and I think we're getting a front row seat to it that was that was all very well said and uh, what a big boost that would be for the rebuild if Lucas Reichel continues to come into his own certainly something very exciting to pay attention to over the final stretch of the season uh, Coley, real quick, I, I wanted to ask you, as a defenseman, how well is Seth Jones playing right now? I, and, and I mean, I, I know that we're seeing it in the offensive numbers, but it seems like he's really taken a step into the into the leadership role on this team following the trade deadline. And, uh, you know, it, it just he's really he's really turned it on. And you can go back to January when when his game really started to improve. But uh, you know, there's a, there's a leadership void on the team right now. No two ways about it with Jonathan Taves on the injured reserve list and Patrick Kane now with the New York Rangers. And it's been really impressive for me to to see how Seth Jones has, has stepped up, quite honestly. Yeah, you know, number one defenseman in the NHL. Um, there There isn't a 32 of them. There's there's only probably 15 of them. I'm talking the true number one guys who, who, who play 27 minutes a night and really control the entire game from the back end. Um, and, and that's what we've seen out of Seth since pretty much since he got nominated for the All-Star game. Um, he's He's gone to a new level. Uh, yeah, the points are there, and we focus on the points um, and the goals. I mean, a couple of really pretty goals, but he controls the entire pace of the game, the flow of the game, the way the puck is moving up the ice um, defensively, breaking up a ton of plays with his sticks. Sure, listen, the guy is an offensive-thinking defenseman. There's going to be moments where he's caught, whatever. Like, that's going to happen. It's 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 part of that, you know, give and take of risk versus reward, but – he, he really has, has stepped up. And, and look, Seth, he's a quiet leader. Um, again, like, uh, you get to see things down between the benches, Kaylee, uh, you know, that, that um, you don't see in the broadcast booth and you can't see or hear in regular stands because of the glass. But, you know, you'll never really hear Seth yell or scream. Um, but he leads the way he plays, and he was the best player on the ice last night, in my opinion. I thought he was probably the best player on the ice, even in the Nashville game. Um, I really did. I just thought he was so engaged in the game, um, and I think his leadership, Chris, and and is it's going to be all about what he does on the ice, not so much what he says. Um, that just seems like, and so I think he's like, okay, we need a leader. I'm not naturally going to yell and scream and have a million things to say. So I better up my game um, and lead on the ice. And and I think we're witnessing that uh, and give him credit because, because this is a difficult situation for him. This guy signs his, his big ticket, his big token thinks he's coming here to play with hall of famers and, and flurry and Kane and, you know, and things look a lot different, you know, 14, 16 months later, 18 months mm-hmm. later, whatever it's been. And he's, his game is going like this. Um, so you got to, got to, got to tip your cap to that. Yeah, Anything I think you want to add to that, Kaylee? 
Yeah, I mean, that was really well said, Colby. I, I don't think I could add too much more. I like that you said engaged. You guys are being really nice to me today. I, I, I would like to say that you've both said that to me now today. I, I'm going to get a recording of this for, for, uh, for later that I can watch, okay? <laughs> um, I, I really enjoyed his game, too. Like you said, he doesn't get too high, doesn't get too low. I think right now you can kind of see a light at the end of the tunnel, too, with 19 games left, like – you got to put everything out there right now. This team needs a leader. It's it's going to be tough. Some of the opponents you're going to run into and uh, confidence more than anything right now. He covers so much ground out there. It can be difficult, you know, if you're a defensive partner to be able to play with somebody like that. His reach, his puck moving ability, jumping in on the play, knowing when to sit back and support him uh, when he picks his when he picks to go. So it's I think he's he's getting that support. His brother's been playing with him. He just looks like he's having fun after he scored those goals. I mean, th those were some of the most emotional um, celebrations I've seen from him yet. So it's just a, a confidence thing for him right now in his decision-making and believing in his ability since, since All-Star, but especially now um, when a lot more pressure is going to be on him to, to score goals and to make it happen for this group. Totally. All right, well, should we... Do sellies and chirps. Mm -hmm. Gloves. Sellies Celli <laughs> and chirps, yeah. Time for a glove change. New gloves. <laughs> call me Ryan O'Reilly. They call Putting him the factor. The factor. Mm, I like that. You know, like the O'Reilly factor? Very, very clever. Very clever. Hockey nicknames can, can be very, very ingenious, I think. Um, <laughs> like this Sellies or Chirp for that matter Selly or Chirp um, I, I, I don't know maybe ingenious is too strong of a word but here's the thing it's March and for me it's the most wonderful time of the year because <laughs> it's Shamrock Shake season and to, to put out a, a misnomer that I've that I heard someone inexplicably say <clears throat> Kaylee <clears throat> You get the Shamrock Shake at McDonald's, not Starbucks. Just need to, to <laughs> quench the fires of misinformation there. Uh, it is a McDonald's delicacy, the Shamrock Shake. And uh, look, it's, it's back for March. I circle March on my calendar every year. I make my annual pilgrimage to a McDonald's drive through and I get myself a Shamrock Shake, and it, it's, uh, it's a wonderful experience. How do you guys feel about the Shamrock Shake? Well, if my Starbucks question answered that, I am <laughs> chirping it. I think you have a very sophisticated palate, Chris, but I do not uh -huh. like Shamrock Shakes. Kaylee, and... don't lie to everyone, please. <laughs> sophisticated uh, I, I don't palate. like it. I think it's gross. I don't like those dyed colored drinks at Starbucks or McDonald's. I will never get a shake. I don't like the texture of shakes or smoothies anyway. I'm really sorry, but it's a big chirp for me. I do not circle Shamrock Shake Month on my calendar, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you know, Chris, in the least surprising news, I do believe you that you, sh you do circle your, cam or your, your calendar. I, I very much believe that. Um, I, I, I got to go no, I got to plead no contest on this one because I've never had one. And I, I've literally never had a shamrock shake. Um, I do not really like the milkshakes at McDonald's though. So I probably wouldn't like it. Although I love a good milkshake. I mean, Kaylee knows like there's milkshakes being ordered at my house all the time. I'm always telling her even the other night in the studio, Scott ordered dinner and I was like, yeah, can you order me a milkshake? It came with a straw, like literally <laughs> four foot long straw. Yeah. This was um, during root canal gate. So he was exactly a milkshake Dude, from a barbecue place with a 10 foot tall straw. <laughs> why would you have a, why would you have a milkshake with a root canal? I mean, wouldn't you get a dry socket or something? <laughs> so I actually never got the root canal. They ended up just taking the tooth. So, oh. cause the tooth, the tooth broke, so they were just like, now nah, we're just taking it. So I, I have no tooth back here wow. um, for now. 
And for the first couple of days, I had stitches in there. So I was just really eating smoothies and soup and milkshakes. Um, so <laughs> Scott ordered dinner and I said, OK, I'll take a milkshake. So that's 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 the context for that. But, you know, Chris, like I have a hard time supporting anything going on at McDonald's. Uh, so I'm going to go with Kaylee on this one and and chirp you. Um, I'm kind of surprised that the shamrock shake isn't a subway thing because, uh, you know, that would make a lot of sense for you. $5, um, <laughs> $5 shamrock shake, $5 I guess. New gloves. <laughs> um, but, uh, I would encourage you to have a shake from small Cheval or all Cheval at some point because their milkshakes are delicious. Absolutely delicious. So, well, um, I appreciate the honesty. And, uh, you know, again, I'll just say that if you're not with me, you're against me. And <laughs> I do have a sophisticated palate. Never, oh, never forget not. that that was said on this podcast. <laughs> and we're going to get that edited out. Listening or watching, if you're lactose intolerant, doesn't matter. You can still have a shamrock shake because there's zero dairy in a shamrock shake that's how so you it's know zero. it's absolutely <laughs> horrifying whatever <laughs> ingredients are in there the <laughs> green no comes straight from the chicago river <laughs> yeah yeah you're probably right you're probably <laughs> right <laughs> oh i don't even uh, want right. to know on that all note, right kaylee what do you next? what do you got kaylee okay well first of all colby i didn't realize you were such a milkshake connoisseur slash snob i respect it but it's it's nice um i got my spots i got my spots okay i'll go this is off off kilter it's not one of my usuals i'm very eager to hear colby's response but um (laughs) i've i recently went down a little rabbit hole with my guy bieber love justin bieber big hockey fan um and there's a lot of beef going on between his ex boo selena gomez and his new boo Haley bieber um so, are you team B or team Selena, Jelena, or team Haley in this? Chris, I'll start with you. And uh, are we selling or chirping this whole this whole drama thing with the two of them and my guy Biebs? Well, I, I think that you know, and I'll speak for Colby on this as well. I think <laughs> Kaylee, both of us have the opportunity to you know have this be a learning experience. And so I'm certainly looking forward to, to more details from you about the the nitty gritty related to the Haley Bieber Selena Gomez drama. Um, having said that, I think it should go without saying that I'm obviously in Selena Gomez's camp. Um, still wish that she and Biebs were together, a uh, teenage romance oh. that they had back in the day. Um, Sappy guy. Yeah, I love you know, it. I, I uh I like I like Selena liked some of her uh her early singles stuff um kind of around the turn of the previous two decades and you know she's uh she's got she's got Disney Channel ties I really like that and um you know no no disrespect to Haley Bieber obviously um you know her Fila campaign is doing great she's got billboards downtown Chicago that I see on a, on a regular basis. So um, I will just say though, that I think Selena has got more closure to her relationship with, with Biebs than, than Justin does based on the fact that he's passive aggressively trolling her at, uh, at this party or whatever, or whatever the case <laughs> His was birthday there. bash. <laughs> His birthday bash, Bieber's birthday bash. So um, I guess I'm going to uh, take this opportunity to, to celebrate Selena Gomez and and uh, congratulations for for moving on. I love Good that. for you. Oh wait, I that's that. Olivia Rodrigo. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, well, there we go. Colby, let, please let, give us your synopsis. Let, let me just say this is all very <laughs> educational for me. Uh, we'll start with that. <laughs> um, I look Justin Bieber. How can you not be a Biebs? Like he's he's a talent. I mean, the guy has come out with so many. It, literally, every song is a new pair of gloves for him. Um, the guy has just come out with so many bangers throughout how many years it's been. Um, you know, it, it's uh, and he's a hockey guy. Uh, love all that. 
the the relationship drama is all new to me in the in Bieber's land. Um, every now and again, I'll see the headline, uh, on, you know, on Twitter or trending, and I kind of and I kind of cruise it. But I will say this: if I have to pick a side, I, I'm probably going Selena Gomez because, like, Selena Gomez also a major talent. You know, I'm not probably I probably don't know as much of her music as you you maybe do, Chris. You made it seem like you. I mean, you kind of went went pretty deep there on your knowledge. Um, <laughs> I don't probably have that level of institutional Selena Gomez knowledge, um, but I really don't know anything about Haley Bieber. So, um, you know, Selena's talented. I mean, that would have been a, a serious power couple, those two. Uh, they've had their their public ups and downs, but... Um, Hey, I'm 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 rolling with you, Kaylee and Chris. You know, if, if I'm picking sides, you know, I'm 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 going with Selena Gomez just purely on the fact that she's a major talent. I love What's it. Your take, three for Kaylee? three. I I you know what? I used to be uh, Team Haley because I I I I love Selena, but I actually love her now that she's been very forthcoming with some of her you know, mental health issues and her struggles. And I see her a lot differently now. Before, I used to be very envious of her because I did not think that her bangers were that banging. I did not think she was a talented rock star and I felt like she was riding on Biebs' coattails a little bit with some of her music. And I was just not a fan of her music. I was a fan of them as a couple. And now I've kind of flipped and I miss Jelena a little bit. I liked that... <laughs> I liked them growing up together. I'm nostalgic for the teenage Jelena as opposed to current Bieber and Haley. I just feel like, I don't know, everyone's starting to, to go Team Selena. Haley's apparently lost millions of followers. There's a lot of videos out there. How Colby, will you sleep, Haley? Colby, I mean... you have some homework to do tonight in between your, your college hockey games. Stick in an hour of TikTok hole for the <laughs> Selena and Haley Bieber drama. Asked Alex if she's in on it. It could be a group effort, but I'm very proud that all three of us came out Team Jelena on this one. Fresh gloves. Everything we comes are, naturally. We are ducks <laughs> flying together. <laughs> we are we are ducks flying. <laughs> fresh gloves. <laughs> Jeez, that might have to be like our new. Is that our new safe word? Fresh gloves. Um, I think so. When we do something well, I like fresh gloves. Slogan. All right. Well. Hopefully our listeners uh, enjoyed our pop culture. If you're still here, thank you. <laughs> if you're still here, I've got mine. Uh, and this is a real life Selly and Chirp for me. Um, it's kind of like a, a Kaylee Selly or Chirp normally because your Sellys and Chirps usually just bring this great debate to our podcast. And I want to understand why here um, in Illinois, when you get on the highway, I, I you know, get on 90, uh, you know, 90, 94 right here by my house. I live a little bit, you know, in the city, but a little west. What is with the stoplight on the on-ramp to get onto the highway? Like, I cannot fathom what the reason is for this other than to annoy me. Um, because it does nothing. All it does is make people sit on the ramp and then they can't even get on because they're starting from a dead stop. Like when you're merging onto highway traffic, you need some momentum. So the stoplight, it, it's, it's mind numbing for me. And I'll be honest with you. Most of the time I cruise right through it. I mean, because I'm like, why, why would I stop? But I mean, look, obviously you don't want to like run a red light. Is it even a real light? Like I don't even, I can't wrap my head around it. It frustrates me. We've been going downtown a lot, Alex and I. So when we go downtown, we jump on, you know, we jump on 90 for like three exits to Ohio street. Um, what I like, what are we doing with the light? I, we don't have these to get on the highway in Philly. They, they're not there. You know, like maybe they're in other places. I don't know. You guys are both more Midwesterners than I am. It really irritates me. I'm chirping it all the way. Get rid of the damn stoplights to get on the highway. Help me out, you two. Tell me I'm not crazy. <laughs> or you will tell me I'm crazy, yes. But let's hear your thoughts. 
I don't think you're crazy at all on this one, Colby. Uh, I I will speak to it being perhaps more of a Midwest phenomenon. Uh, The stoplight on-ramp exists in the metropolitan Milwaukee area as well, where I'm from. Um, Yeah, it's it's super annoying. I mean, I I, I do understand the concept, and I, I think it is to streamline the flow of traffic onto the freeway, especially during rush hour, which in Chicago is from, you know, 7 a.m. until 7 (laughs) p.m. But, uh, you know, it's designed to, I think, in some way regulate the the flow of traffic that goes onto the freeway. But I don't I I would love to see a study that analyzes the effectiveness of that, because I don't think it has any impact whatsoever on traffic or traffic jams. I don't think it facilitates highway traffic more. in any way yeah um because yeah, now there's a backup on the on-ramp in exactly. addition to the freeway so i i'm with you i would say at the very at the very least i i practice my rolling stop when i go up against one of those and uh i i've i've rapidly increased the level to which i ignore those stoplights so i i'm i'm chirping them as well 100 percent um <laughs> I mean, I think I'm just going to chirp the fact that you both think you're above a red light. Like, you have wow. to stop. <laughs> but is it a real light, though? Do you really think you're above stopping at a red light? Like, who are you guys? Not it's a not real red light. The wheel. <laughs> not, like, it's I would real. never. It's, if it's red, it's real, <laughs> and you stop. Like, I don't like it, and I don't know that it impedes traffic or it helps the flow, but, like, I certainly, <laughs> I'm going to stop. That's insane. That you just coast through it <laughs> absolutely negligent no behavior i am coming the other way no i am chirping yeah. the fact that you think you can blow off a red light at your own will so <laughs> i'm chirping you pretty hard on that but i would have celebrated the fact that i don't really understand the necessity but chris did a nice <laughs> job at summing up what may be the the answer to your question i mean can you guys just imagine i'm literally sitting there the other day as i'm seeing it going i can't wait to talk about this on the podcast like so annoyed (laughs) trying to trying to get trying to get where i'm going but but kaylee but let me ask you for real because look it could be i could be coming home from the airport in the middle of the night you know sometimes we get back in the middle of the night and there's no one on the road and i could be sitting at a red light in my neighborhood for the full duration, not a car in sight. And I would never go through a red light in that scenario. Even if I couldn't see a car coming for days, I would be too scared to break the law and go through the red light. So I do just want to clarify that I would (laughs) never go through what I deem a real red light. And I'm sure this is where you're going to, you're going to squash my argument because who am I to choose what's (laughs) a real red light? not? But I just feel like red lights are so, everyone can go from their, sorry, from their own direction, <laughs> you know? And like this, there's yeah. no other directions. Like yeah, this it's is not just an like, intersection. Yeah. It's just to inconvenience people. Yeah. I mean, I, I certainly understand like when you're getting on a highway, you're like gassing it up, you're ready to roll, you're looking you're going. Left, and you're, you're going. So that red light is kind of wild to be hindering your, your thrill, but I still think you should stop at it. <laughs> full stop. So you're so full, you're full stop. Yeah, I mean it's pretty quick. It's like bum bum bum. So it's it just t- it keeps you on your toes. So no no listening to music too loud. No texting obviously. So make sure you're paying attention for it. But I love the thrill of beating a yellow to red every day. I love speeding up to get on the highway and checking you know checking right and left. But that is a full stop when I see anything red I don't question it but I I do I do think it's kind of insane to stop on your way into the highway that is a that's a great point it it shouldn't be a thing (laughs) well at least we know who's going to be doing the voiceover work for the next Massachusetts transit safety video uh, for kids drivers (laughs) test Uh, you can recruit Kaylee Chelios Um, it will be a hefty fee but you can recruit her to that (laughs) Who knew the letter of the the law showing what not to do? (laughs) I guess the letter of the law spells Kaylee Chelios. Who knew? Thank you. All right. Well, (laughs) this was a, uh, this was another fun sellies or chirps. Uh, This was another fun episode guys. Uh, We didn't have a guest this week, but we plan to next week. We'll keep you updated on that. Any closing thoughts, comments, questions, concerns. 
Go Hawks. Go Hawks still. Yes, absolutely. Go you're going you're going on the road today, right, Chris? Yep, yep, heading to Detroit and then down to South Florida. I've got my sunscreen packed and I'm ready to go. <laughs> SPF 150 for you. SPF 50, uh, but yes. <laughs> you were close ish. But uh, yeah, man, got to. Uh, I, I just what can I say? I have fair skin. I burn really easily. Gotta 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 protect it. But uh, <laughs> we'll see how burned I get down uh, with about forty eight hours in the in the sunshine state. Stay tuned. Um, this was a lot of fun. Appreciate my co hosts Colby and Kaylee as always. Our thanks to our producers Jenna and Trevor, and to our. Resident DJs, Brad Dollar and Southside Jake, for contributing the music featured on Blackhawks Insider. If you're looking for more content, Blackhawks.com has got you covered. There is great stuff on Blackhawks.com, from articles to video to our podcast episodes, so be sure to bookmark Blackhawks.com if you haven't already. We'll talk to you next week on the Blackhawks Insider podcast. Thanks for stopping by.